It began deep in the Arctic Ocean, where the atmosphere is warming twice as fast as the rest of the Earth. It was the changing climate over the North Pole that determined the outcome of the winter of 2014 in North America. Strong westerly winds sent extreme cold air from the top of the world all the way down to the tropics. In an extraordinary event called the Polar Vortex. In the United States, on the south shore of Lake Erie, is the city of Cleveland, Ohio. It's a place often impacted by large winter weather systems. Betsy Kling is chief meteorologist at local television station WKYC. This morning started off just about where we thought it would, below zero and just a couple degrees above zero, depending upon where you were. Seven below this morning's low in Worcester, Lorraine, five below, three below in Ashtabula. Mansfield started right at zero, and Cleveland and Akron were one above. I will roll into work, and the first thing I do is take a look at what's going on right now in my area. Then I will get into the forecast models. If we have any kind of a storm system in the offing, and I'm constantly hitting refresh on the browser and looking at the model data as it comes in hour by hour. I think a big chunk of my day is coming up with the most likely scenario. All of that is an effort just to try and get people prepared, at least get them in the mindset of what could be coming, especially if it's something that's going to be impactful weather. Betsy pays particular attention to storms coming down from Canada and across the Great Lakes, creating powerful weather events. When you have cold air coming across the relatively warmer water of a great lake, you are going to have lake effect. And that is a kind of one of the hallmarks of Northeast Ohio weather. We're known for lake effect snow. And when that lake effect snow really gets rolling, you can have some pretty incredible snow totals that come out. Around here, 70 inches of snow for the season is not unusual. Many cities like Cleveland are well prepared. But there's a more dangerous winter event that meteorologists pay very close attention to. It begins high in the atmosphere above the Arctic Ocean. Humans live and breathe within the lowest level of Earth's atmosphere, known as the troposphere. It's where airplanes and birds fly and storm systems form. Travel higher and you reach the layer known as the stratosphere. It is here a large region of air known as the polar vortex exists. The polar vortex is an area of low pressure that sits typically right over the pole, so it exists in both hemispheres, so the South Pole and the North Pole. A low pressure system is actually a minimum of pressure. But the winds around the lows rotate, and so a jet stream is created. A very fast wind that goes around the polar vortex with extremely violent winds. And these violent winds somehow isolate the air inside the vortex from the air outside. So, visually, a polar vortex would look like a huge whirlwind with a radius of about 1,000 kilometers, a corridor of extremely powerful winds that would be around 30 kilometers high and that would maintain, in a fixed way, an important and extremely dense layer of cold air. The term vortex refers to the anti-clockwise flow of air in the North Pole and the clockwise cyclone of air over the South Pole. The associated winds can be extremely fast, up to 300 kilometers per hour. It separates the subtropics, mid-latitude air from the Arctic air. The air inside the polar vortex tends to be minus 60 to minus 70 degrees Celsius. And this west east circulation around it acts like a, a, a barrier fence. It keeps the cold air trapped over the Arctic region. You can have some extreme situations where chunks of the polar vortex will begin to break off and move around the northern hemisphere. 
Disturbances of this polar vortex often occur so that its shape is no longer circular around the pole, but it can be moved, even deformed. Temperature differences, cold air over the poles, warm air over the equator, are what drive all weather on Earth. With the climate on planet Earth changing, no place is warming up faster than the Arctic. Its ocean and sea ice are currently undergoing a strong warming event, forcing ice to melt, polar bears and walruses to crowd onto shrinking beaches, and reindeer and caribou to starve. The mid-stratosphere temperature over the pole can get up to more than 65 degrees Celsius warmer than normal. When the warmer air weakens the polar vortex, the jet stream can veer off course. Cold air breaks out of its Arctic grip and travels south. The jet stream instability also brings warm air north. Unusual cold air is matched by unusually warm conditions in Greenland, Arctic Canada, and Alaska. As the world ushers in a new year, unbeknownst to the revelers celebrating on this winter night, a threatening historic weather event is forming thousands of miles to the north. Over the Arctic Ocean, warm air is displacing the jet stream and causing the polar vortex to stretch to the south. Now, when all that warm air rushes into the, into the Arctic region, kind of knocks the polar vortex off its perch there on the North Pole, and it starts to wander. Without an active upper-level vortex to keep frigid air bottled up over the Arctic, the cold air mass is forced southward. And I like to think of the polar vortex kind of as a spinning top, closely held rotation, tight rotation, and then occasionally you get this rush of warm air from lower latitudes, and it kind of that bangs the top, and the top then starts to wobble, it got pulled, stretched uh, like a rubber band moves away from its typical place over the North Pole, starts wandering at lower latitudes. It could be Asia, it could be Europe, it could be the, the United States. And where that polar vortex will go, it will take the cold air with it. The jet stream dips to the south. The cold air mass flows across the frozen snow-covered landscapes of Canada, which keeps the air cool. As it makes its way further south towards the United States, meteorologists begin to take notice. A piece of the polar vortex begins to shift southward. You go, oh, and it's very interesting, right? Going to watch that, going to keep an eye on that one. Do both models or all three models or four models have that chunk of the polar vortex coming toward us? We have to kind of think ahead for people and keep them ahead of the cold air before it gets here. Trying to track those bad boys down, that's where things get a little interesting as far as doing a forecast goes. We cannot prevent the polar vortex, but we can always possible to forewarn so that people can be aware of it and equip themselves. Polar vortex strength can be possible to forecast few days in advance, but it is not possible a month or season ahead. So we have only limited time frame to prepare ourselves. When we observe an increase in temperature in the stratosphere, we predict that there will be a possible destruction of the polar vortex, and therefore a possible cold snap. As the models improve, we are able to have relatively reliable forecasts 15 days in advance of the evolution of the polar vortex, and therefore the probability of cold spells in advance. I think a big chunk of my day is coming up with the most likely scenario all of that is an effort just to try and get people prepared, at least get them in the mindset of what could be coming. Downwind, longer range, we could be looking at some significantly cold air coming in. Even if that cold air doesn't hit until day seven, I'm talking about it today because that is a huge deal for the folks around here. And when I start telling people something extreme is going to happen, it, it gets your nerves up a little bit. People are afraid. The polar vortex blasts its way south over North America, 
leaving heavy snowfall and ice in its wake from the Canadian Prairie Provinces to the American Plains and the East Coast. Strong winds prevail throughout the freeze, making the wind chill temperature feel like it's 10 degrees Fahrenheit colder than it actually is. In Boston, Massachusetts, which is covered in over seven inches of snow, the temperature drops to two degrees Fahrenheit. With the wind chill, it feels like 20 below zero. The winter storm of 2014 is just getting started and already breaking records. 23.8 inches of snow in Boxford, Massachusetts, minus 10 below in Fort Wayne, Indiana, 11 inches of snow outside Detroit, Michigan, with temperatures around the state near or below zero degrees Fahrenheit. Lake Erie begins to freeze over. Once you're talking about a polar vortex shifting south, you're not talking about just a quick little clipper storm system that moves right through. You're talking about literally a chunk. It's an air mass. Air masses are big and they need very powerful forces just to get them moving. So we're talking about several days of dealing with this, as long as the pattern is still moving. If the pattern is stagnant, now we could be talking about weeks. An enormous Arctic air mass is descending on North America, producing high winds, heavy snow, and dangerously cold wind chills. Temperatures plummet from the Northeast to the Midwest United States. Businesses and schools are shuttered. Roads begin to close. On this morning, Chicago's O'Hare International Airport checks in at minus 27 degrees Celsius, breaking the previous record for this day there are 1,200 flight cancellations. On television, meteorologists attribute the massive cold spell to a phenomenon most viewers had never heard of before. Everybody was just throwing around polar vortex where two years before, nobody even knew it existed, uh, except the meteorologists and the geeks. The polar vortex has existed for millions of years. So it's not a new phenomenon. It occurs every winter, however, uh, TV meteorologists really first used it and introduced it to the media in 2014 where we had this extreme cold. By 6 p.m. on the evening of January 6, the temperature in Cleveland plunges to minus 24 degrees Celsius, a drop of 45 degrees. Cleveland and Northeast Ohio, winters can be pretty tough, but when you put the polar vortex into the forecast, now you are literally bringing the Arctic south. <laughs> and when you bring the Arctic south, that impacts everything. Now you're talking about car batteries freezing and people's tires deflating. Uh, you're talking about windows freezing shut. Your cell phone won't work the same and you're breathing and you're trying to stay warm and it is so cold that literally the inside of your mouth and your nose would freeze if you didn't have it covered. So when I start putting into my forecast temperatures of 17 degrees below zero, 18 degrees below zero. Literally, this hurts. This is painful cold. The gloves that you wear are probably not gonna be enough if you're gonna be outside for any extended period of time. A study in the medical journal The Lancet concluded that the cold affects more people than heat waves. The study found that in Europe, there are 20 times more deaths due to the cold than to heat waves but this represents only 1% of the total. In reality, the cold kills many more indirectly. The increase in deaths in winter between December and March is often due to infectious diseases caused by the cold. In this case, influenza. The cold can cause respiratory problems, especially in asthmatics, and finally, in people with cardiovascular disease. The problem is the polar vortex is deadly because of not only cold air, but also it is dry air. The dry air causes human ailments such as asthma, bronchiitis, sinusitis, and nose bleeding, etc.
Hypothermia can also set in when your body loses heat faster than it can be produced. Hypothermia represents the greatest danger in the face of the cold, since this hypothermia will gradually lead us to drowsiness and even coma, which can lead to death. In the winter of 2006, James Kim was driving his family through the snowy mountains of the Oregon Coast Range when they got lost in bad weather. Kim set out alone on foot in the cold wilderness to seek help for his stranded family. Frostbite can happen in minutes on any exposed skin. It's the body's survival mechanism, cutting off circulation to extremities to protect vital organs. The blood no longer reaches the hands, the nose, the cheeks, the ears, and this constitutes frostbite, which will sometimes be difficult to treat. The body will try to fight against the cold, in this case through the dynamic of shivering, which allows us to recover warmth through our body. Lost in the snow in search for help, James Kim sheds some of his clothes along the way. Medical experts believe he may have become disoriented by hypothermia. When we reach lower temperatures, around 35 degrees, we already begin to have problems which are generally neurological problems, that is to say, drowsiness, which will finally bring our bodies into a vicious circle. Because if we become drowsy, we are no longer active. We no longer supply heat, and gradually, this temperature will decrease with temperatures that become lethal, below 30 degrees, and certainly below 25 degrees. The body of James Kim was found 11 days later, seven miles from his family's car. In the United States alone, up to 1,500 people die from hypothermia every year. The elderly, the young and the homeless are the most vulnerable. The first thought we have when a cold spell arrives in France is in fact homeless people who do not have the means to maintain a high level of heating and are exposed to hypothermia. Unfortunately, people who die from the cold are often homeless people. It's unfortunate, it's still unfortunate to say that in the 21st century in France, we still have people who die from the cold, but our metabolism needs to have a little bit of warmth. And inevitably, when we have extremely intense cold spells like this, it has impacts that can go as far as death. The Red Cross, from November to March, reinforces its commitment to these underprivileged people in order to put them in more acceptable conditions and, above all, to protect them from the cold during these periods, which can last more than 10 days and is much more difficult to bear than if they lasted only one or two days. A cold wave struck much of Europe during the winter of 2012. Temperatures in Paris approached minus 10 degrees Celsius, 10 degrees below normal. Altogether, the cold killed more than 824 people across Europe and as far south as North Africa. Communities, particularly impoverished ones, need enough lead time to prepare for the next polar vortex. That is the goal of France's National Meteorological Service. At Météo France, we tend to be extremely vigilant to warn people, which is our main mission to be able to protect all the people who may be impacted. To forecast the polar vortex well in advance, in order to save lives, research data is needed from the atmosphere. We're going to model the troposphere and also up to the top of the stratosphere. We're going to model all this, and supercomputers will allow us to see a little bit of the evolution within this polar vortex. See if it continues to be intense, or if it tends rather to weaken and meander, and be able to see incursions of cold stratospheric air at lower altitudes. One of the simpler ways for scientists to study the stratosphere is using helium balloons. These very high-tech balloons are capable of lifting a telescope into the stratosphere. 
On va accrocher. We're going to hang this little box on a big balloon that we're going to inflate with helium. Inflate et qui lui va monter après en altitude. And which will then go up in altitude. Et les transmetteurs vont nous permettre. And the transmitter will allow us to receive data in real time of temperature, pressure, humidity, and the GPS position will allow us to deduce the wind. We will be able to go very high in the stratosphere to be able to observe these extremely cold temperatures. In fact, it can go up to 20, 30, 40, 50 kilometers in altitude before it explodes, and then gravity will cause the box to come back down to Earth. At this altitude, it's difficult to obtain measurements using more conventional means such as airplanes. And weather balloons cost less than a sounding rocket or a satellite. The United States and France are the world leaders in the development of weather balloon technology. Another tool to measure the polar vortex is LIDAR, which stands for Light Detection and Ranging. It's a remote sensing method that uses a laser to measure surfaces of the Earth. Combined with other data, LiDAR generates precise three-dimensional information about the shape of the Earth and its surface characteristics. LiDAR are extremely sophisticated instruments. They involve sending pulses of powerful laser beams into the atmosphere. Based on this return signal, we can determine the properties of the atmosphere. Measurements we make, in particular of temperatures and winds, allow us to detect disturbances in the stratosphere. For example, sudden heating of the stratosphere, which then propagates towards the poles, which can lead to the destruction of the vortex. We are in the process of setting up real-time data analysis systems that can then be used to validate the forecasts of the weather models in near real time. The European Space Agency's Aeolus Space LIDAR was launched in 2018 and is currently in operation. This is the first time we have direct wind measurements from space on a global scale. There is also a future for LIDAR in space. Four days into the cold wave that grips the United States, Babbitt, Minnesota reports the coldest place in the country at minus 37 degrees Fahrenheit, minus 38 degrees Celsius. The cold air reaches as far as Dallas, Texas, which experiences a low temperature of 16 degrees Fahrenheit and minus nine degrees Celsius. Three Amtrak trains are stranded overnight west of Chicago due to ice and snow drifts on the tracks. Here in Northeast Ohio, in, in the midst of the polar vortex in 2014, and you're talking wind chills, 35 to 40 below zero. And it had been a very long time since we had anything that cold. So the wind chill is a calculation of the heat loss from your body in extreme cold temperatures. The heat loss is expedited, so it, you lose more heat when the wind is blowing. The heat is literally being just taken off of your body. And in two, 2014, we had some incredibly low wind chills. You know, I know the northern part of the Great Lakes, they started to get into where you're talking 50 degree below zero wind chills. I mean, that is like Siberian level wind chill. We don't get that around here very often. The city had to be ready for water pipes bursting, water mains bursting, because the ground is so cold and uh, it, you know, literally it shifts the ground when you have a deep freeze. And so we had a lot of, we had a lot of water mains that were bursting here in Northeast Ohio and beyond. My dad was a firefighter going out fighting fires and you're standing next to a burning building, you're spraying water on a burning building and it's 15 degrees below zero, guess what's gonna happen? That water is going to turn to ice if it touches you. My dad has had his helmet frozen on his head before. You know, his, his, the exterior of his boots were encased in ice in some instances. In Ohio, schools across the entire state are closed. Ohio State University shuts down, delaying the start of the spring semester. The extreme weather causes the cancellation of some 20,000 flights, along with widespread road and rail delays. A big part of my job is 
kind of holding hands with people and helping to guide them through days on end of extremely cold air. I'm still the one that they're gonna turn to to find out what's going on and more importantly, when is it gonna be over? The dangerous cold wave of 2014 continues to push south over the United States, leaving a frozen world in its wake. Temperatures drop by as much as 50 degrees Fahrenheit, 10 degrees Celsius overnight. Detroit hits a low temperature of minus 14 degrees Fahrenheit. The temperature in Central Park in New York City is four degrees, breaking a 118 year record. The high in Cleveland reaches only three degrees. When we get these extremely cold temperatures, schools are gonna close. The schools are not gonna have kids going to school. So parents need to pivot to try and cover to make sure that their kids are safe at home. They may have to stay home. Now you're impacting businesses. With businesses closed, not even a home is safe from this cold spell. When you're talking 20 degree below zero temperatures, your house may have never experienced that before and you're gonna hear sounds in your house that you've never heard before. There's creaks and groans as your house is trying to accommodate the extreme temperature change just in a small you know, distance between the interior and the exterior of your home. People's drywall could start to crack. We have things called frost quakes. That is an incredibly scary situation. It sounds like a bomb going off, but it's actually rapid ice expansion in the dirt around your home. It can cause cracked foundations. Nashville, Tennessee's high hits minus 13 degrees Celsius. The strain on the power supply leaves thousands without power in Indiana, Illinois, and Missouri. Abandoned cars sit on the highways in North Carolina. Many authorities declare a state of emergency. Forecasters want to know what sparks the polar vortex in the first place. To get answers, data is required from the Arctic, one of the most inhospitable places on Earth. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Agency, or NOAA, has partnered on a program using a fleet of drones that sail. These sail drones are used to collect important atmospheric and oceanic data from this remote and harsh environment. So we took our knowledge from buoy observations, right? Picture like little miniature weather stations out there in the middle of nowhere. Buoys are fixed, they don't move. These we can move, we can tell them where to go if we see something interesting. We use wind for propulsion. The wing tab allows the sail drone to um, steer with a very small amount of, of electric power. Um, and then we use the solar panels that are on the vehicles to uh, generate power for the sensors. We're able to operate for a very long time in areas that are very far away from uh, land or fuel sources. We have designed these so that we can get data in the most extreme weather to help with weather forecasting. The Arctic sail drone can collect roughly two million measurements per day, including wind speed, pressure, carbon dioxide, and air and water temperatures. The data are transmitted via satellite and available in near real time to both researchers and the public. Analysis of the data confirms the Arctic is warming and the sea ice is melting. Sunlight normally reflected away by bright white ice is now being absorbed by the Arctic Ocean. You're taking away ice, you have open water. Open water is much warmer, first of all, it's much warmer than the ocean, but now you have this transfer of heat from the ocean to the atmosphere that didn't exist. At the beginning of 2019, Scientists detected a sudden stratospheric warming event in the atmosphere above the Arctic Ocean. The temperature over the North Pole is more than 50 degrees Celsius warmer than usual. The warm air helps to weaken and split the polar vortex over Europe and North America. The cold air causes temperatures to plummet, while Siberia is much warmer than usual. The shifting of the polar vortex has plagued Siberia with wide-scale wildfires, loss of the frozen permafrost, and an invasion of pests. 
In the winter of 2018 in Europe, a mass of cold air brings icy temperatures hovering between minus 16 degrees and minus 20 degrees. Snow is falling in Monaco, a Mediterranean city that usually enjoys mild winters. This cold spell really affected all of Europe, and we can see that, on the contrary. There is cold all around Europe, but there is warmth at the pole, therefore warmer temperatures than normal. So in Western Europe and Mediterranean Europe, the cold is quite exceptional. We are used to having rather mild temperatures during the winter periods, which means our bodies are not necessarily accustomed to having such extreme temperatures and so can suffer. It has an effect on the metabolisms and especially on the heart. Having snow in more Mediterranean areas always surprises us a little. There had been several centimeters of snow. The eastern and southern parts of Asia are not immune from the effects of the polar vortex. Here, some populations that are unprepared for the cold are especially vulnerable. In the year 2016, the cyclonic circulation in the Arctic has changed or weakened so that the cold air plunged into the equator regions and it has moved all the way to East Asian countries. In some of the East Asian countries, this cold air has created havoc, especially in the Hong Kong, Taiwan, China, Japan, and in India. More than 85 people died because of these cold events in Taiwan. Snowstorms happened in Japan, and it is also some people have died, and also few dozens of people in the Hong Kong has died in northern India, and it has formed a lot of fogs in the northern India, and it has affected the air traffic as well as most of the trains have stopped in, the, in that region and it has created a lot of discomfort to the people. Unlike Europe and US, India is not prepared for such a cold weather conditions. So people are not aware of it, so they are not able to prepare well in advance. However, they have their own method of preparedness for this cold event, such as keeping the water bottles or thick blankets. There is some evidence that rising ocean temperatures, disturbances in the jet stream, and increasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere may make the polar vortex over the North Pole unstable. It could expand southward more often, sending more frequent or severe Arctic blasts into inhabited areas of the Northern Hemisphere. The state of the climate, it's changing. Granted, it's always been changing, but it's changing differently than it's changed before. And the one thing that kind of comes up as a commonality in that change is man, us. We're the ones changing it. Human activity, industrial activity, cars, you know, transportation, is polluted the atmosphere with more and more greenhouse gases. The one that's best known and is thought to have the largest influence on the climate is carbon dioxide. That leads to gradual warming of the atmosphere. As far back as 1896, the Swedish scientist Svante Arrhenius hypothesized that changes in the concentration of carbon dioxide in Earth's atmosphere could alter surface temperatures. It's called the greenhouse effect, because just like with greenhouse, you have glass, so it, it allows sunlight to come into the greenhouse. Uh, it heats up, but it traps the outgoing infrared or thermal uh, radiation. A region that we know to warm the fastest, that the models project to warm the fastest, is the Arctic. In fact, since the mid-20th century, temperatures have increased about twice as fast in the Arctic than in the middle latitudes of the planet. It's a phenomenon known as Arctic amplification. This accelerated Arctic warming, this Arctic amplification, has created a very favorable environment for more of these disruptive snowstorms. These disruptive snowstorms wreak havoc. Here in Boston, the winter uh, that everybody remembers is 2014-15, where we had you know, 90 inches of snow in three weeks, and it was very difficult to travel. The roof collapses. And then besides the snow, you have you know, the cold, which is you know, dangerous and increases the number of deaths you get. 
We can see that each year there is more and more melting of this Arctic ice pack. And this means that more heat is transferred to the atmosphere because when the ice pack is there, it isolates the heat that is in the ocean from the atmosphere. And if the ice pack melts, there is more exchange of value towards the atmosphere and more atmospheric disturbances that can produce these winds that bring us cold spells. What I am mindful of, though, is that the extremes are becoming more extreme. If I see the polar vortex beginning to shift, that's when my mind goes, OK. You know, the forecast models are showing me a pretty extreme situation. Now it looks like those extreme situations could actually become more likely rather than the models just blowing it up into oblivion. But not everyone in a position to take action on climate change accepts the facts. Politicians have testified that extreme cold weather disproves that the Earth is actually getting warmer. We keep hearing that 2014 has been the warmest year on record. I asked the chair, you know what this is? It's a snowball. And that's just from outside here. So it's very, very cold out, very unseasonal. And despite a long list of unsubstantiated global warming claims, Climate activists and environmental groups will cling to any extreme weather-related headline to support their case for global warming and to instill the fear of global warming in the American people. In 2019, after a polar vortex blew in, President Trump conflated the severely cold weather with long-term climate change by mocking global warming. Climate scientists know better. It's overly simplistic to only say that climate change leads to warmer, warming. That there is actually, it's, it's more complex, it's more nuanced, that, that there are other factors that are involved. What we're seeing, these, these cold snaps, you know, these colder outbreaks, these snowstorms, is not inconsistent with climate change. Uh, that because the warming is not uniform, it can have, you know, kind of uh, really important uh, implications, consequences, repercussions for the behavior of the polar vortex, where it's the polar vortex is weakening more often than it used to, and, we, and, and once you get a, a, a breakdown or disruption of the polar vortex, the, the frequency or probability of getting severe winter weather you know, really meaningfully increases, it significantly increases. And if you weaken the polar vortex more often, that will contribute to these ep more you know, increase in episodes of severe winter weather. The frequency of the polar vortex, especially the weakening of polar vortex, is goes on increasing year by year, especially in the last few decades, and this will be going to continue in the global warming scenario. So we have to be prepared for such cold events in the East Asia region and mid-latitude regions. I think we I think we will see on average a warming of the climate. But also, we will see an increase in sustainability, that is, more heat waves. But also, perhaps more cold spell episodes. Afterwards, the problem is whether the average increase in temperature will be compensated for by the increase in cold spells. These issues are still very much under discussion at the moment. After more than a week of cold temperatures, the Great Lakes of North America begin to freeze. Lake Erie is almost entirely frozen due to its shallow water. Two months later, the rest of the Great Lakes are nearly frozen over. The thick ice cover traps ships on Lake Superior. Supply lines and economies are disrupted. A United States Coast Guard icebreaker struggles to keep shipping lanes open. On Lake Erie, where the water temperature is just below freezing, frazzle ice, a collection of loose, randomly formed needles of ice, is about to cut off the water supply of an entire city. And in this case, it turned out to be the city of Avon Lake's water intake in Lake Erie. So the water temperature is 32 degrees, and because the water is roiling, it's always moving, you don't have any ability for those ice crystals to begin to solidify, unless they touch something that is also below freezing. And 
we have ice crystals, unbeknownst to us. They're, we can't see them, they're microscopic, but we had all these little ice crystals floating around in that water. So you have a very rapid ice buildup on the water intake for an entire water system that feeds a city and areas beyond. And now they can't pump water into the water treatment plant. They also have a diver who is going down to inspect that water intake. And sure enough, that baby was frozen solid. The mayor of Avon Lake warns residents that the city will be out of water in hours. In the middle of this historic polar vortex, 200,000 Ohioans across several counties are about to be hit by a veritable drought. On Lake Erie, the cold wave of 2014 is threatening to cut off the water supply of tens of thousands of Ohioans. Slender shards of ice are blocking the city of Avon Lake's water intake pipes at the bottom of the lake. They wanted to get pumps to get hoses out into the lake. Well, the lake is frozen, so now you got to go out, you got to go through the ice to get to the water to insert the hoses to begin manually almost with giant generators pumping in these, the water to supply an entire city with water. With the danger now over, water restrictions are lifted. Nevertheless, the polar vortex continues to blanket the American continent. From the Rocky Mountains to the Atlantic Ocean, the frozen Great Lakes to the tropical climate of Florida. More than 200 million people, over half the population of the United States, are affected. At Disney World in Orlando, the high temperature one day earlier was a mild 75 degrees. Now, the thermometer drops to 34 degrees Fahrenheit, one degree Celsius. A wind chill advisory is issued for most of South Florida. Homeless shelters are opened. 2,200 residents of Pensacola Beach lose power after increased electricity demand causes a shutdown of the local utility. It is the beginning of spring 2014 when meteorologists expect average temperatures to return. A ridge of high pressure finally moves into the eastern United States, bringing average and above average temperatures to the region. The cold wave that came down from the Arctic is over. More than a dozen deaths are attributed to it, with dangerous roadway conditions and extreme cold cited as causes. Northeast Ohio, we were most impacted in early January by the polar vortex. It's funny now that the, the PV is out, right? So everybody knows what the PV is, the polar vortex. Um, now we can use that a little bit more. And we are starting to see, you know, people respond to that. They know it's going to be cold when you say polar vortex. And they know it's going to be colder than normal when you say polar vortex. It's very disruptive to society. 1% of mortality you know, is due, you know, people that die in a year is due to extreme cold. The cities that see the, the greatest number of deaths are the coldest cities. So places like Cleveland, Detroit, Chicago, Minneapolis have the highest death rates due to cold, and these are the coldest cities. It is the worst weather event for the economy since Hurricane Sandy that struck a year earlier. With 20,000 canceled flights, airlines lost millions. Gas prices in New England hit record levels. Losses are estimated at $5 billion. The polar vortex is changing. It is affecting more people and larger areas around the world. Neither nations nor continents are immune to the icy blast of Arctic air. It's a global problem that can no longer be ignored. So, you know, our society developed around the climate and the weather that we currently have. So any shift away from the current climate and the weather that we experience is most likely to increase 
uh, will be a more hostile weather and climate to society. As a society, it is in our best interest to tr come together, you know, in an instrument like the Paris Accords to try to mitigate and try to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. There's lots of benefit to societies to come, you know, work together to mitigation of, you know, the, the worst predictions of extreme weather that are expected with, with climate change, you know, and, and continuous increasing greenhouse gas. If we follow the Paris Climate Accord, it will be always possible to contain the polar vortex. Basically, the carbon footprint has to be reduced in such a level so that we can reduce the polar vortex in the coming years. The global warming scenario continues to go on, then the Arctic sea ice will melt completely, especially during summer. By the year 2050, we will not have sea ice in the Arctic. A few decades ago, maybe in 1980s, in Antarctica, there was a ocean depletion. And by that time, the Madrid Protocol has come into force and it has been well over. The carbon footprint I reduced by changing the gas in the fridge and other places so that we are able to reduce the carbon footprint and we are able to see that the ocean depletion has come down in Antarctica. Similar way, in Arctic 2, we have to be follow the Paris Protocol to contain the carbon footprint, either by individual or by the government or the societies. Arctic de-amplification is still possible this century which may help reduce potential increases in persistent extreme weather events. Some climate scientists believe a reduction of air pollution in the industrialized countries could actually restore some of the natural temperature difference between the middle latitudes of the globe and the Arctic. I don't think we fully understand what are the consequences of climate change. In my lifetime, there have been a lot of surprises. And as I'm talking to you about what, you know, the behavior of the polar vortex, that was not, you know, even considered 10 years ago, 20 years ago. So that, but that, you know, that's both a source of comfort and, 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 and concern. We grew up in this very optimal type of climate. And, you know, we're really, you know, playing with fire when we're changing that climate. And inevitably, I think almost inevitably, a change will be a change for the worse, not a change for the better. But in the short term, some countries are discovering the best way to save lives is to provide affordable housing and shelters. Since we cannot prevent the polar vortex, we have to make comfortable shelters for the people to hide from the polar vortex. Otherwise, it will be difficult for the human in the years to come. Since polar vortex is dangerous, we have to prepare ourselves both before warning as well as the prediction system has to be improved so that people can be saved if much, at least 10 days before in time. Already, in terms of procedure in France, we have a winter plan that is systematically put in place at the beginning of the winter season to, among other things, protect people who may be a little bit subjected to extreme temperatures, as we have experienced during cold waves, and we will act as an alert. We have a vigilant system that has been extended to show the risks that we could experience in the next seven days. Despite the risks of bitter cold, the polar vortex creates some incredible displays of nature. The polar vortex episode of 2014, we were introduced to light pillars. Basically, it's suspended ice crystals. It's cold and you're freezing, but oh my gosh, it's so beautiful to see the light stretching off of any light source. And that light is just refracting and reflecting off of all these tiny ice crystals that are suspended in an Arctic air environment. It's, it's just stunning. And, you know, we saw in 2014 
Some of the more beautiful results of these ice shoves or ice heaves on the south shore of Lake Erie from Cleveland all the way to Buffalo of just huge blocks of ice and people were out climbing on them and all that. We had snow rollers and we had very cold temperatures and we had high winds. So basically that snow begins to move and it's literally the little snowball rolling up. When the lake freezes over, incredible slow motion waves of crushed ice emerge from the shoreline and gradually plow through anything in its path. By January and February 2014, record-breaking low temperatures and snowfall amounts struck parts of Canada and the eastern United States. We hadn't had cold air like that for 20 years. And yet, 2014 would not be the last of these mysterious migrations of the polar vortex. The most recent being January of 2021, and it too proved to be as historic as some of the coldest weather ever recorded in the southernmost region of the United States. It paralyzed cities like Houston, Texas, Little Rock, Arkansas, and Hastings, Nebraska. Temperatures plunged to as low as minus 30 degrees Fahrenheit, while heavy snow and ice storms left millions without power and triggered catastrophic freeway pileups. But as scientists and politicians continue to debate the role global warming plays in the root cause of these disruptions of the polar vortex, what's becoming more and more certain is what happens when these disruptions do occur. I do think having extensive periods of severe winter weather, extreme cold and heavy snowfall are becoming more and more dependent on a breakdown or a disruption of the polar vortex very, very cold temperatures and the pain that that can inflict on people and the, the literal body hurts that they can have. But man, there's some fascinating things that happen too. And that's where you just start to have an appreciation for all things weather, atmosphere, earth. It all comes together. And I'm just the lucky person who gets to tell people about it. It is one of the most mysterious regions on earth. We are only beginning to understand how weather works in the Arctic. But when it comes to the meandering polar vortex, what we do know is that what goes on in the Arctic doesn't always stay there. <laughs>